one, one competition for everyone. Because it wouldn't be fair. But in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us all different. Some have more virtue than others, some have, yani some have more traits than others, some have more strength than others, physical, emotional, spiritual. Everyone's given with different, bestowed with different bounties. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has adjusted the exam based on our weaknesses or strengths. That's the beautiful part. So the fact that we are living in this end of times era, or closer to the end of times, far away from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the trial, trials and tribulations have changed have become much more what was expected from the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in warda that level of perfection although is matloob is desired but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to forgive us even if we do much less because the environment is so much more difficult there's one incident where the Prophet ﷺ began to speak about the virtue of the Iman. Who has got the most virtuous Iman? And the gist of the story is that the, virtue, the virtuous Iman are the, is of the people who will come at the end of times. So what about, they have the best of Iman? Don't the angels have the best of Iman? No, we have the best of Iman. And the answer the Prophet ﷺ kept on giving was that why would the angels not have perfect iman when they can see what others can't see? I mean, they can see things. Obviously, we can't see them, but they can see so much. Okay, what about the prophets? What and what about what about the companions? So why would you not have a perfect iman when wal wahi yanzil? Well, revelation is descending upon you, upon me in the midst of you. So angels have something that others don't have. Sahaba have something which others don't have. But when it comes to the time when people will come after Rasulullah's time, long after, when they will not see obviously angels, they will not see Rasulullah, they will not see the miracles that happen at the hand of Rasulullah, and they will blindly follow Allah and his Rasul, their iman is going to be of another level. As once the Prophet said, I wish I could meet my brothers. And they said, Are we not your brothers, Ya Rasulullah? We're doing everything, right? Imagine, imagine as they were saying, we, we put our life in our palm and give it to you. If we are not your brothers, then who is your brothers? Who do you want to go visit? Who, would you, who are you missing while we are right around you? He said this after a burial. He went to, in, in Jannatul Baqiyah, there was a burial. Rasulullah after the burial, mentioned this statement, I wish I could see my brothers. So he said, are we not your brothers? We've done everything. We, you know, we want to be with you. We're trying our best to be your brothers. Prophet ﷺ said, بَلْ أَنْتُمْ أَصْحَابِي You are my companions. You're not my brothers. You're our companions. Suhba, Yeah, you're with me. You happen to be in the same time I am in. Allah chose you to be with me. You're very honorable. But you are still Ashabi. You're my companions. Ikhwani. You want to know who my brothers are? وَلَكِنْ إِخْوَانِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِي وَلَمْ يَرُونِي My brothers are those who will believe in me without having seen me. MashaAllah. My brothers are those who will have believed in me without seeing me. Beloved friends, this is the name of the game. This is the virtue Allah has given you and I. That we, we have to believe. The, uh, people may say that, oh, believing in Allah and Rasul is hard. We can't see, especially after this weekend's workshop. A lot of questions, a lot of thoughts, discussions. One thing I've heard is, well, you know, it's not easy to believe. Since you, this, uh, there's no... Uh, you, you know, it's, it's not something that is tangible. It's not something you can feel and touch and smell. There's no coordinates to Allah, right? So don't let's not let's not make it sound so easy. Subhanallah. But that that is the imtihan, right? That is exactly what you know. If someone complains that the the, the bar exam was hard, or the medical board certification exam was hard. What we'll tell people, of course it's hard. No one said it was easy. Where did you hear it was easy? Find me one place that says it's easy. It's meant to be hard because after this, you are now actually have a right, a license to practice as a lawyer. You can go defend people in court. You can go stand in front of the judge. You can do a whole bunch of other things as a licensed lawyer. And as a, as a, um, uh, as a licensed medical professional, you can actually license to go work in so many hospitals and uh, clinics and to help treat people and mashallah along with that make some money too 
Huh? So the idea is, no one said these things were easy, they were hard. But what, look at what you get at the end of it. Similarly, belief in Allah and the Rasul and the unseen is the big challenge. I agree. No one said it's easy, it never was. But once you have been able to accomplish this, what's on the other side? Jannah al firdaus Pleasure of Allah, waridwana min Allahi akbar. Happy. And not only over there, guess what? Over here as well. Listen, only with the permission of Allah are the hearts, only with the remembrance of Allah are the hearts going to remain content. True happiness and joy will not come with the abundance of material things. True abundance and joy will come with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if a person is sleeping under a bridge with one piece of small cardboard and a brick as a pillow and some uh, half a loaf of bread that was thrown at him by someone, but he has Allah in his heart, by Allah he will lead a much happier life, a much more content life than someone who has multiple yachts and multiple jets and multiple palaces, but he has no Allah in his life. Although he is drugging himself with his material wealth to make him feel that he's happy, but by Allah he cannot be happy. The Quran says that. Listen, with the remembrance of Allah is where the hearts will remain content. But he looks content, he looks to you like that. He looks to you like that. But inside, Allah knows how horrendous He feels, how empty He feels. And you know what the proof of that is? Take these material things away from Him. Take these material things away from Him. Put Him in a place where He doesn't have access to that and ask Him, how do you feel? And a believer, whether he's on the throne of the king or he is inside the dungeon of that same king or the next king, he will feel content with the decree of Allah. He will feel at peace. He will feel at ease. Let's look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would say that, Ya Allah, allow me to be grateful one day and allow me to be a patient one day. That's what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa would fast every other, you know, every other day at times or Mondays and Thursdays, of course, 13th and 14th and 15th of the month. He would fast regularly. As you know, Sulaim Dawood was about fasting every other day, but Rasulullah sallallahu would also fast like right now. This is, you got Muharram, he'd be fasting. Uh, Ashara al Hajj, he would be fasting. Of course, the month of Ramadan, he'd be fasting. The month of Shawwal, a majority of it, a big portion of it, he'd be fasting. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa fasted a lot. And he wanted to lead a life in which he would be eat enough to be thankful and then stay hungry enough to be patient, have to be patient. Both. One day, it was very norm. He comes into his house, Ya Aisha, is there anything at home? His beloved wife, our beloved mother, is there anything at home to eat? And she says, there's nothing. I understand the concept. When people say, I have a difficult life, I'm going through something you don't understand. Okay, I don't understand, true. But are you going through difficulty to, uh, to the degree that Rasulullah Sallallahu went through? Seriously. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's difficulty starts from when? From page one. Born without a father. Huh? And he born after his uh, uh, father passes away. Was an orphan. The first page is already filled with difficulty. Before he even came into the world, Allah began to test him. And page after page after page, as we were reading yesterday morning, this book, Sacrifice. What does it say here? You know, read. What is it? There you go. The legacy of our beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah. Legacy. This is what Rasulullah left behind. I mean, isn't that amazing? Sacrifice. Yani, challenges. D- bearing difficulty. Giving up what you have, what you want for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This whole story is about a compilation of hadith about the struggles and the hardships of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what we were reading after Fajr yesterday. Right? So this is, uh, this, is, uh, the, uh, this is the mirath of Rasulullah Sallallahu This is what he's left behind. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes ask Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, is there any food? And what does she say? There is nothing. Nothing to eat right now. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam responds by saying, إِذَنْ أَنَا صَائِمْ If that's the case, I'm just gonna fast. Simple as that. I'm gonna what? Fast. I'm gonna fast. Yeah, you put yourself in a situation like that. Have you ever come home? Ever come home? And said, what's for food? The answer is yes. Have you ever heard say there's nothing? You may have said that. I may have said that. May Allah forgive me. 
and may Allah forgive you if we ever said something like that. But you know, there was never, if we even said it, there's nothing, we were lying. Our pantries are filled with food, alhamdulillah. Our freezers are filled with food, alhamdulillah. Our fridges are filled with food, alhamdulillah. Then you have an extra chest freezer in the kitchen, or in the basement, and in the garage, and sometimes two. Sometimes in the backyard. Oh, we have sometimes multiple full goats inside there. How could we not have, how can we say we don't have enough food? We have food for a whole year inside our homes. I was mentioning earlier today that our Ustad, Mawlana Sulaiman Chokhsi Damat Barakatum, he would tell us, he would say that this ye freezer or fridge ne insanon ko aaj bakhil bana diya hai. Warna log isse pehle jo kuch khaya wo khaya aur bakhiya sare padosiyon mein baat dite he said, today this freezer and fridge has created a, a, a sense of hoarding within people. Before the advent of this refrigerator and freezer, you would eat and whatever was left over, you go split it and share it with your neighbors. Done deal. And you would not think about, oh, what am I going to eat tomorrow? We never thought. None of our elders, our grandparents ever thought, what are we going to eat tomorrow? But we'll see. Tomorrow has a different sunrise. Tomorrow has a different sunset. Tomorrow comes with its own meals. So they never thought about, I have to hoard, otherwise tomorrow I won't have. Oh, why don't you just give, you just ate. Mashallah, why don't you give it to your neighbors? Why don't you give it to so-and-so? No, I have to eat tomorrow. This wasn't the case. The tawakkul in Allah was, is so ajeeb, the technology has actually made it so much more difficult in certain senses to lead a life as a true believer. And that's why the reward is going to be greater. In the presence of the smartphone and in the presence of all this technology, if you remain firm believer in Allah, your reward is going to be greater. Because the tests are more. Routinely I tell students that I thank Allah Azza wa Jal who allowed me to study over in, 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 this, in the madrasa overseas before the smartphone. As I was in my graduating year, it slowly had started coming up. Otherwise we had the simple Nokias. The most you could do was play snake on it. You know what that is? Snake? Not the snake that, you know, the one in the, the zoo. That was a game. <clears throat> Very simple, boring, absolutely boring game. But that's what was the beginning of this fitna. To say, why are you grown man with great degrees sitting there playing this completely useless, foolish thing? You would have never thought a human, a very fully developed human being would be wasting his time doing stuff like this. <laughs> but subhanAllah, that's the name, of the, the name of Dajjal. Deception. Foolishness. It's a very big web that has been placed on the minds of the people. Video games, artific, you know, computer games, all those type of things. Where you look at people, adults, grown up adults, educated people doing things like this. So khair, anyway, I was saying that Alhamdulillah, I graduated from Madrasa when only thing was the simple Nokia's. And also we didn't have, what would you do in class? I mean, we, you even, we actually used to wear watches that time. We used to have a watch. <laughs> Subhanallah. Right? It was, it was those days. And now I tell students that, yes, we always tell you, put your phone away in class. Take it away. Leave it at home. Leave it in this, that. It's hard. But inshallah, if you remain firm and study a good, a good student of knowledge, in the presence of the fitna of phones, your reward will probably be far greater than ours. Because we never were tested like this the way you are being tested today. So we go, let, going back to Rasulullah's life of difficulty, he fasted one day, and he, uh, many times he would fast, and many times he would you know, not fast, but the idea was, I want to remain between patience and gratitude. That's a, such an important thing. Because these are two big doors to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's paradise. One is Babu Sabr, and one is Babu Shukr. One is the door of patience, and one is the door of gratitude. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given virtue to different times and different places. <clears throat> like Rasulullah said, Khairu ummati qarni. The best of my nation are the earliest part of my nation. Qarni, my generation is the best generation. Best portion of my ummah is my generation. <clears throat> then those who will come after them and those who will come after them. The era of the Sahaba. And what comes after the Sahaba? The era of? Tabi'un, and after that, the Tabi'un, Tabi'un, right? So this, the, 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 the era of, of, of these first three generations is the most virtuous. So there were some, it's, it's mentioned about a pious elder. He would go to the baker, and he would always ask for a day-old bread. 
People would say, why are you asking for a day-old bread? When people say, can, like myself, say, I want, can I want to get something fresh right now? They tell me in the donut shop, everything's fresh. I said, no, no, no. When a bagel, I want something that just came out now. There's all of these things that came out right now. Give me anything that just came out right now. I want something super fresh. So he would say, I want a day-old bread. So why are you asking for a day-old bread? Who wants to eat day-old bread? When you have an option of eating fresh bread. He said, I want a day-old bread because this d- bread was baked one day closer to Rasulullah than today's bread. It was, it was baked closer to Rasulullah's era than today's bread. These are ushaq, these are lovers. They are in a special state, in a special hal, in a special condition. Not necessarily that everyone has to emulate this, but the idea is this is what love does to you. When you love someone so dearly, then you will say things like this. And you will do things like this. But he has a point. The era of Rasulullah was definitely the best era. And Rasulullah was definitely was the best individual. So being closer to him is, the, is, the, is, 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 is of great honor. But now we are here in this day and age. It's not, oh, we're in the worst era. Forget it. I'm done. Instead, what I was telling you is that Allah knows when we were born and where we are born. And the fact that we don't have Allah and Rasul, uh, we don't have Rasulullah in front of us. And the fact that we have cell phone and we have Reddit and Netflix and we have a Discord and WhatsApp and we have all sorts of a hundred other apps, social media apps, and a hundred other sources of confusion available for us. And we don't have the, 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 the presence of many of the awliya and atqiyya that were around. So my beloved brothers, the expectations from us also are less. Again, my honorable Ustad, Mona Choksi would say, he said this 22, 25 years ago, he'd say, in order to become a wali of Allah. What's wali? A friend of Allah. Friend of Allah is a big thing. Any verse of the Quran that Allah SWT speaks about to the awliya, what does Allah say? Anyone know? What are the two things the awliya will be granted? Allah. Yes. Allah inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Listen, O oh, the friends of Allah. Listen, Allah, indeed, the friends of Allah. La khawfan alayhim, nothing to fear about of the future. Walahum yahzanun, nothing to grieve about the past. You have such a life that you should be happy. Nothing to be afraid about the future, nothing to be afraid about the past. You are always in enjoyment. You say, well, how is that possible? You just said Rasulullah's life was difficulty. The Sahaba's life was made of difficulty. It was difficult, difficult. Exactly, it's all about the perception. It's all about the perception. This is what the non-Muslims outside and the weak Muslims outside who are wanting to leave Islam need to know. That Islam gives you such an amazing perception, such an amazing insight, such an amazing outlook on life that you can always have a smile. And that's what Rasulullah did almost all the time. When he would meet people, he would smile. There are companions who say, we never saw Rasulullah but that he was smiling at us. That same Nabi is tawirul ahzan daimul fikr? He has lengthy bouts of sadness in front of Allah, always worried about the ummah. He, so he's worried about the ummah, crying about the ummah, standing up at night, majority of the night, majority of the night standing, until his feet, tafattarat qadana, his feet have become swollen. Yet when he looks at each uh, other, what is he doing? What is he? He's smiling. And what else does he say? He says, Afdalu sadaqah, the, one of the most beautiful forms of sadaqah and virtue and tudkhila surura fi qalbi akhik al-muslim aw kama qala alayhi wa sallam is to make your fellow brother happy we're not talking about spouse husband wife kids mom and dad here we're talking about the brother making this brother happy the brother making this brother happy if you can make him happy if you can make him happy this is one of the most greatest forms of virtue so I was looking for the shoes i can wait let me help you find your shoes Right? Someone's trying to carry something. Say, I can carry, help you carry this to the car. Right? Someone's looking for their <clears throat> lost keys. Someone lost their child. Someone is looking for a ride to the hotel, to the airport, to, to the restaurant. Whatever it is, you're just coming to assist people. But why? You don't even know me, I don't even know you. It doesn't make a difference. Afdalu sadaqa. Most greatest virtue is to make someone happy. And I, if I can be of some assistance to you and make you happy, then I'm going to get the most amazing reward. But say you can't do all of that. You because you are running because your wife's waiting in the car and your kids are screaming and you gotta go. Right? Then what happens? At least smile at someone on the way out. At least show some compassion to someone who's going through difficulty. At least congratulate someone. 
when you see a when you see a, an a, 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 a event happening, someone got married, someone finished the al Quran, someone achieved something, you know, a recognition. You hear someone just graduated from high school, someone moving on to got accepted into this school, that school. Someone, mashallah, got is joining the one-year program. Someone's graduating from the Alim program. Okay, I don't know who he is. I don't know who she is. I don't know anything, but I'm happy because you're happy. That's all. Because your son is happy, he has made you happy. And because you're happy, I'm happy as a believer. So I'm going to give you a hug. I am going to give you a hug and say, MashaAllah, Mabrook, Mubarak, Barakallahu Fikum, Taqabbal Allah. Why, why, why am I so happy? People, people don't like this, by the way. They say, why are you smiling? It's not your daughter, not your son, not your wife, not your mom and dad. What you, someone else, what are you getting excited for? I'm getting excited for because the ummati of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he's happy today and that is a sufficient reason for me to be happy. Okay? So this is, I know these are some beautiful fundamental points before I speak about the, because I know speaking about uh, the Ashura, there's a few hadith I have to share and then we're done. So alhamdulillah, these are some points that if we get these fundamental points in place, they will be very beneficial. So I want to speak about Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says, I make dua to Allah. I say, Ya Allah. He said, three things I have. I love this story. He said, three things Allah blessed me with. In which, and most people won't understand this. You know, how? So Allah blessed me with three things with regards to the blessings of others. He said, number one dua. What is Abdullah ibn Abbas known for? Who knows? Boys, do you know what Abdullah ibn Abbas is known for? What did Allah bless him with? A lot of money? Huh? Yes. Uh, what did Abdul, oh yeah, what was he known for? What was something, which science was he a master of? Huh? Hmm? Okay. Anyone else? Yes. All right. So, tafsir. Okay, that is correct. So, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made lots of dua for him. Allah ma'allimu ta'wil. Oh Allah, you know, teach him the ta'wil, the interpretation of the Qur'an. He was a Sayyidul Mufassirin, the leader of the scholars of tafsir. Re- leader from this, of Sahaba, and that's why you have heard, although he was young, who used to keep him next to him? Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu used to have him sit next to him. Right? You're special. Come. Now, you know, just imagine a community, you have someone, some, one of the brother's son is always next to the imam sitting right here in front. It natural, the other community members will say, how come my son is not there? Huh? So someone said, why is the Amirul Mu'mineen always have Abdullah Abbas next to him? Why is he given this virtue? So he heard it, and he wanted to show it why. So then he asked everyone, you know why? When you see the help of Allah coming, and you see people entering into Islam in hordes, in huge armies, in large groups of people, people entering Islam, glorify and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ and seek His forgiveness إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely most ex- willing to accept the tawbah you heard of Surah Al-Nasr right? so he said the way I'm asking all of you right now Umar al-Khattab Amir al muminin said tell me what's, what is the background of this verse? what is happening over here? Well, one after another people started saying this is uh, great news this was Rasulullah s.a.w. was being informed of what? Fath Makkah, conquest of Makkah. Things will change. Thousands of people accept Islam. You'll see. So now, you know, this is glad tarin, bishara. Everyone else said this. He asked young Abdullah ibn Abbas, what have you got to say? What did he say? Exactly, mashallah. He said, this is the news was given to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi The Prophet Sallallahu was informed that his death is now around the corner. Complete opposite. Complete opposite. Explanation. He said, that is why when this, when this surah was revealed, someone began to cry. Who was crying? Abu Bakr Sadiq. And all the people looked at him and they said, what's wrong? Mabala Shaykh. Why is the shaykh crying? The surah is telling us we have victory. And people enter into Islam. And alhamdulillah, the time has come for victory of Islam. Why are you crying? They didn't understand. But he understood what others did not understand. That victory means 
mission accomplished. And mission accomplished means you're going to get called back. This is a moment for us to cry. You can look at the immediate happiness, sure. But beyond this is very sad news coming. Whenever something completes, immediately starts deteriorating. As soon as the house is done, the deterioration begins. As soon as the car is pulled off the lot, the deterioration begins. So this is what we are speaking about over here. Abdullah ibn Abbas was given this title of Rais al-Mufassirin because of what he had. Knowledge of tafsir that no one else had. You all got the story? Okay, so the story is still beginning. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, I have three, I, I, this is the condition of my heart. What is the condition of my heart? The condition of my heart is I make dua to Allah, I pray to Allah, that Allah should give every Muslim and every believer in the Quran knowledge of every verse equivalent to the knowledge I have. What is, what is knowledge? Knowledge is power, isn't it? No, if you have knowledge, you run the show. You have knowledge, you, run, you, you are able to run the company, you are able to run uh, the business, you, you are on the mic. On the basis of knowledge. Who would make a prayer like this? He said, as much as knowledge I have. I would, because of this ilm, I was brought to sit in front of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu in every gathering. I want this knowledge of tafsir, everyone should have this. This is what we call being a well-wisher for others. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu is giving us three examples of how he was a well-wisher for everyone. You got the first one? He wanted every single person to have what? Same equivalent deep knowledge, unparalleled knowledge of the Quran the way he had. Yes. Number two, he says, I look at a rain cloud in the sky, you know, in, 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 in Khalij, in Makkah, in, in, and um, not, oh, not only in Khalij, but specifically in Hijaz and specifically in Makkah and Medina, you will see rain is, is, not, uh, is, is very uncommon there, not too common. And the rain cloud is, you don't usually see that too often. It's a big thing. It's usually just a big, clean, empty sky. So he said, when I see a rain cloud, the Arabs would get excited. Rain cloud is coming. All run out to the streets, right? This is a big thing. He said, I see a rain cloud coming and I sense that it is pouring down rain somewhere. I'm happy. And he said, I'm happy because I know someone's garden is getting much needed rain. I don't own that garden. I don't know who that garden belongs to. I have no investment in that garden. But I am simply happy because I know today one owner of a garden will be very happy when he sees the cloud over his garden pouring down rain on his garden. Number three. He said, when I see that two people who have disputes amongst themselves, they are arguing and fighting about some issue, one is claiming that you, I own this. And the other one says, no, claiming I own this. One says, you have oppressed me. The other one says, no, you have oppressed me. And they are both going to a judge. A Muslim Qadi. Who is God-fearing, who is honest. And I hear that their case is being presented in front of an honest judge. I become happy. Even though I have absolutely no vested interest... And no share in that decision making process Or who wins what but the, f but the fact that someone is going to get their justice in court And is going to walk out happy from that courthouse Makes me happy Subhanallah This is what you call being clean hearted This is what you call being a well wisher That it's not about you It's not about what, what is it in it for me It's about I'm happy because you're happy. That's it. I'm happy because you have a smile on your face, I have a smile. Why are you smiling? Because you're smiling. I don't need to have another reason to smile. Okay, why are you smiling? Because I want you to smile. That's why I'm smiling. This is a beautiful trait that as Muslims we should ha have to learn how to give the sadaqah. Everywhere you go, smile. Smile with the niyyah of making other people happy. And when you see others smile Because you're happy at their happiness And this is what you call being a true Muslim And a well-wisher And this is What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Through this simple small action Will give us huge rewards 
And it is this happiness that Islam is telling, that's showing you, is what I was talking about the awliya will get. The awliya don't have to die to enjoy life. The awliya enjoy life right here. And the awliya enjoy life, they don't have to have a lot of material things to enjoy life. They enjoy life in poverty more than the ones who don't have friendship of Allah enjoy in wealth. The awliya enjoy life in sickness more than those who don't have the friendship of Allah enjoy in health. The awliya of Allah enjoy life while being tested by disgrace and false accusations more than those who don't have a relationship of Allah enjoy a life of honor, fame, and name. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving, giving this, this reward to the awliya. Our ustad, honorable teacher would say, Mawlana Sulaiman Chokhsi again, that in order to become a wali, is zamane mein wali banne ke liye sirf do cheezon ko zirrat hai. Mawlana, Mawlana Jamal is over here. Also if a, a student of Mawlana Chokhsi sahab, I'm sure you remember this thing too, he probably mentioned. He said that in order to become a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to do two things. Number one, you all have heard this from me, please. Repeat. Two things. I know although this crowd is a little newer, maybe than the ones who are. Kisu ki yaad hai? Do cheez hai. Agar ye kar le, insaan Allah ka wali ban jayega. Ek cheez karna hai, ek cheez nahi karna hai. Okay, very good. Thank you. Staying away from haram. Haram se bacho. So stay away from haram. Stay away from haram. And the next thing? Increase voluntary actions. Okay. Good. Very like, logical. Nice uh, guess. What else? Tawakkul. Okay. It's even, even simpler than that. He would say, haram se bacho. Or panch vakti namaz ke paabandi karo. Faraiz. He said, stay away from haram, be punctual on your fard. That's it. He said, nafil, tahajjud is great. But the zamana and the era is so challenging. He would speak to, he's not speaking to random people on the street. He's speaking to graduating ulama. That if you just do these two things, you'll become a wali of Allah because he knew the, and he knows the era we're living in right now. Malana is saying, it's so hard to stay away from haram. If you can stay away from haram, you've already reached 50% of the wilayah in the friendship of Allah. Because you see, you gotta say, come on, man. Where's the tahajjud going on? Where's the every other day fasting? What about memorization of the Quran? What about memorization of this? What about doing this thing? If you do all of that and you're involved in haram, you're not a wali. You do all of that and 10 times more than that. All the volunteering, the non for profits, and the khidmah of the masjid, the khidmah of the orphans, and everything else. But if we are not staying away from haram, big problem. Staying away from haram is the number one thing. Ishtinab al maasi. Stay away from haram. And that's why Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi in Bidayat al Hidayah says, Ta'at and righteous deeds, everyone can do. But he says, staying away from haram, only the Siddiqeen can do. Only the Siddiqeen, only the absolute truthful ones are going to be able to stay away from haram. Another great scholar, I think it was Dr. Tanweer Ahmad, I think so. He came here and he was at the airport apparently. And I think it was this is his story. And he said that um, he was in America at the airport. He said, Oh, ho, to to giri padi hai zameen pe. he said, Friendship of Allah is lying around. Just pick it up. Imagine you've got, you got gold nuggets on the ground valued at $100,000. You would have to earn all your life to get that. And it's, it's spewed on the ground, spilt on the ground. Yeah, you grab it. He said, In America, when he came here, he said, I see wilaya and friendship of Allah. Spewed on the ground, spilled all over. You just have to grab it. He said, Hazrat, what are you talking about? We have such a hard time here. He said, in this case, in this country, if you guard your gaze, you're a wali. If you guard your gaze, and you guard your eyesight, and don't look at haram, you will automatically become a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Easier said than done. What do you think? Huh? Easier said than done. Now, this was before the advent of smartphones. Uh, with that around, we are now in wilayat has become even more easily accessible. 
Uh, it's not just giri padi and it's actually on your breakfast table, it's on your couch, it's on your bed sheet, it is on your pillow, it's on your sink. Wherever you go, it's wilaya. Just protect yourself from looking at haram, done. And the second thing is being punctual on your fard obligatory acts. You cannot do a lot, no problem. But don't miss out on your fard. Don't miss out on your fard. Beloved friends, if we do these two things, this will be our key to becoming, inshallah, what again? Wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pelichi, what's the first thing? Staying away from haram. Staying away from haram. Staying away from sin. What's the second thing? Punctuality on fara'id. And what are the two gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised in, uh, in, the, gen- in, in, in the Quran for awliya? Don't have to worry about the future and don't have to uh, uh, be sad about the past because whatever happened is all for a good. You're going to get rewarded for everything. My son died, my sister died, my fulan died. He met up in a car accident. Although anything happened, it's not going unnoticed by Allah. Allah is watching everything that you have gone through. And you will be handsomely rewarded for every single thing that you have been through. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah who's given us virtue of certain days and certain months and certain people, He has given us the virtue of living in a challenging time. And where we in this country, where we are right now, and in the difficult situation we're in, I cannot thank Allah enough that you and I are sitting after Asr in a masjid, listening to this gathering, listening to this talk where we could have been anywhere else. This is such a gift. And Allah is making it easy for us. So that Allah who's given preferences has given today and tomorrow a very special um, honor. And so let's go over some of those hadith. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشْرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Indeed, the number of months which Allah with Allah are 12 lunar months. In Allah is saying, I already counted it for you. I made it 12 months for you. 12 lunar months of Allah. Yawma khalaq samawati wal ard. From the day He has created the heavens and the earth, these 12 months have been there. Minha arba'atul hurum. Of these, four are sacred. Of these 12, already four of them have a special significance. Got that? Of these 12, four have a special significance. What are those? Rajab, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. So Rajab is on one side, and Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram are three. So Rajab is separate, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram are together, back to back. Okay? And so these is four sacred months. Now you can say, where's Ramadan? Obviously, Ramadan's got its own virtue. They're not part of the Ashur al Hurum. In Ashur al Hurum, the sacred months, fighting used to seize. The Arabs, the Jahili Arabs, the pre-Islamic Arabs would not fight. That was something expected that your battles, put your, put your uh, uh, arms down and engage in a ceasefire. But in Ramadan, it's so virtuous, ibadah, it's so virtuous, fasting, this, that. But guess what? Battle of Badr took place. Yes, we know that. 17th of Ramadan, the Battle of Badr took place. In, while they're fasting. Okay? So, what is, what is happening? The Ramadan has got its own virtue, but it's not from the sacred four months. It's got its, its amazing virtue. Now, when it comes to Muharram, what is the virtue of that? Shahrullah al Muharram, right? Um, this month is, of course, the first month of the lunar year and the first month of the Islamic Hijri year. 1444, we have begun. 1444. So it has that virtue. And it is interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I mean this is a long uh, thing That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Could have utilized any other incident Of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu To mark the beginning of our year As people would think that it's going to be marked By the birth of the Rasul sallallahu Or by some other major incident of Rasul sallallahu's life But as you are all well aware That our year begins With sacrifice Our year begins with hijrah Hijrah means to leave, leave, where he had to leave his own home. And Rasulullah on the last bend, when he was leaving Makkah, on the last bend, where he would never be able to look back at Makkah until he came back, obviously, 
this was his last vision of Makkah. You know, you keep on looking back as looking back, oh, in Makkah city, Makkah city, Makkah. Eventually, when he came to the last bend, Rasulullah said that, oh, Makkah, you are the most beloved piece of land to me. You are most beloved, the peace land of me, to me. This was the birthplace of Rasulullah. This is the place where the Kaaba is. And then he said, Oh Makkah, Lola Qawmuki. If it wasn't for your nation, Akhrajuni. If it wasn't for your nation that, would, that has exiled me, I would have never left you. He was very emotional in leaving Makkah to Mukarramah because he loved it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses. Which verse? This is in Surah Qasas Last page of Surah Qasas Indeed the one who has given you the Quran I'm asking you Do you know the one who gave you the Quran? Of course You believe in him? Yes You have tawakkul on him? Yes He is telling you Indeed The one who has given this Quran to you He is going to bring you back over here At an appointed time Allah is going to bring you back. That will happen. But this you have to make sabr. Not now. Oh, at its appointed time. So that difficult moment of hijrah is what marks our Islamic calendar. And I'll get, inshallah, if Allah wills, I'll get a little bit into the night of hijrah <laughs> a little bit later here. So this month of Muharram is a month in which is marked by the, the hijrah. And Rasulullah is reported to have said The best fast after the month of Ramadan Is fasting in the month of Allah Shahrullah al-Muharram The month of Allah Muharram After Ramadan the most virtuous time to fast is Muharram Some of, some of us have a habit MashaAllah fasting many days Like Dhul Hajjah we fasted maybe the 8-9 days So Muharram similarly is a month to be fasting profusely Some of you are going to say Yeah Jab Deko every time you talk about fasting we just finished Dhul Hijj You said the same thing Muharram you're going to say the same thing Then you hear announcement of 13, 14, 15th of the month And then you'll have some other virtue What is it? Exactly Rasulullah's life was filled with fast You have any difficulty You fast You, go, you want to thank Allah You fast It's Mondays and Thursdays You fast 13, 14, 15th of the month You fast uh, Some other virtuous day This is how we show gratitude to Allah By fasting It is also reported in Surah An Nisai the best fast after the fast of Ramadan is the fast of Muharram. And the best fast of this month is the fast of Ashura. Got it? The best fast is the fast of, uh, fast of Ashura from all the days of Muharram. And the best fast of, uh, uh, after any month of Ramadan after, uh, is the month of Muharram. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the same Sahabi that I just shared his story about. Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said, I never saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so keen to fast any day and give it priority over any other than this day, the day of Ashura, and this month, meaning Ramadan. Meaning Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never gave preference, never highlighted the importance of any day to fast and give it preference. We know Ramadan, he gave preference, we know that. But he's saying after Ramadan, there was no day that he highlighted more than Ashura. That's tomorrow. Starting tonight, in the next 40 minutes, Maghrib will be here. Right? So this is, subhanAllah, something that we should hopefully you know, make us think how special of a day this is. That this was the most virtuous day. He gave preference to it more than anything else. Ashura has been narrated by more than 22 companions and their narrations can be found in all six books of hadith Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasai, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah as well as the Musnad of Imam Ahmad Mu'jam of Tabrani and many other books 22 companions have narrated the virtue of Ashura it is mentioned in Ahiyah al-Uloom of Imam Ghazali that the reason for this virtue is that it is the beginning of a new year and it is, be it is best to begin with a fast so we don't begin the new year with partying and doing haram. We begin the new year with fast. The virtue of fasting on the day of, uh, on the day 
uh, okay, we, uh, we mentioned is narrated by 22. Now, how do you reap the full benefit? While we may perform the requirements of this particular act, and inshallah get reward for it, we need to make sure we re re reap the full benefit. For example, during the Hajjah, many people slaughter an animal, but few truly have sacrificed. Because they haven't sacrificed the nafs, they haven't sacrificed the ego, they have simply sacrificed an animal. So just like in Dhul Hijjah, we reenact the devotion of Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina uh, Ismail alayhi salatu salam. But we may not fulfill the level of sincerity, tawakkul, dedication that they had. So what, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, he went out to fulfill the command of Allah. He was ordered to sacrifice his son, which he held most dear. In Allah's name. And it was only through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what happened that the, the son was replaced through by a ram sent by Jannah from Jannah. So as we are putting our knife on the animal, we are remembering the sacrifice of Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Ismail. And we say, Ya Allah, similarly, my love for my children and my love for wealth would never come, may it never come between me and you. I will sacrifice my love for anyone if it comes between you and I. That was the gist of what we learned in, in Eid. And so the same is to be found in Ashura. Abdullah ibn Abbas Allah narrated that the Prophet came to Medina and he saw the Jews fasting on the day of Ashura and inquired why they were fasting. They said, this is a righteous day. It is a day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the children of Israel from their enemies. So Musa alayhi salatu salam fasted on this day. And thanking Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam said, We have nahnu ahaqqu bi Musa. Aw nahnu awla bi Musa. We have more right to Musa than you do. So he fasted on that day and commanded the Muslims to fast also on that day. It's reported that the Prophet ﷺ would fast in an Ashura in Makkah to Al-Mukarramah as well. Before he migrated to Medina. However, when he migrated to Medina, he found out that the Jews were doing so. So that's why he asked, why are you also doing it? Now you're going to say, why, did, why were they fasting in Makkah? So there are a few opinions about this. But the Meccans were fasting in Makkah on the day of Ashura as remnants of Islam. Just like they had tawaf and hajj. Although they were mushrik. But this was some remnants of Islam of the past. So similarly, fasting of Ashura was one of those things that remained within them from the remnants of the people of the book of the past that they uh, had somehow, by the will of Allah, was not eradicated from them. The Prophet ﷺ then went on to order the fast of this day and said, it is a expiation of the year that went before. The fasting of one day will become a means of forgiveness for an entire year of the past. But along with this, he gave us another injunction. And he said, Fast on the day of Ashura, but oppose the Yahud in doing so. Fast a day before it or a day after it as well. Khalif. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fasted all nine days, all uh, you know, years, only Ashura. And then the last year, he said, when he saw in Medina they're doing it, he said, if I live till next year, I am going to add one more day. Ninth day or eleventh day? Sunday or Tuesday this year? And, and then Allah Azza wa Jal took him away before that. So he was not able to witness fast in that manner. But that was his was injunction. And so, we learn from here that even in the acts of worship, something as worthy, praiseworthy as fasting, the Prophet ﷺ wanted the Muslims to have their specific, special identity that should be unique to them. And there are many other similar incidents where Rasulullah ﷺ disliked the Muslims to be mimicking the practices of others. For example, the Adhan. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay, we need to give the call to prayer so people should know that Salah is taking place. Some of them said, let's ring a bell. 
Some of them uh, said, let's light a fire. Some of them gave varied opinions. And the Prophet ﷺ rejected all of these. said, nope, nope, I don't want any of these. Uh, we're just calling to prayer. No, but they, other people called the prayer to... Other people utilize these means to call to prayer in their religion. We don't want to do something that is specific to the religion. We don't need to borrow. We can be original. We don't need to be copycats. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the dream to Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. Abdullah ibn Maktoum. Abdullah ibn Abdi Rabbi. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm getting his name correctly, hopefully. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to see the dream. And the dream, an angel came. And the angel gave the adhan in the dream. And then he came running to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I just heard, I heard this. He said, what did you hear? And he began narrating the story of what he saw in his dream to Rasulullah As he's narrating the story of the dream, Umar al-Khattab comes running, dashing in. And he's running so fast that his lower garment, his izar, his lungi, was about to fall. You know when you're holding on, you just wake up and you run? So he's running like that. And he's trying to hit ground by Rasulullah hit the base. But, but he didn't get it. This other Sahabi beat him to it because he had seen a similar dream. He had seen the adhan in his dream as well. SubhanAllah. But then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, first, first, first place. You came first. He got the he got the uh, he got the reward of being the first one <coughs> who saw or th- the adhan in his dream. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam then appointed him as a muadhin. But his voice wasn't too loud. So after some time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam then told Bilal radiallahu anhu to start giving the adhan <coughs> and the sultan because he had a much louder voice. So we, there's so much to unpack what I just said here In this, this one story here So much to unpack Barakah of Mashwara How Allah can use anyone Even someone whose name most people won't know But his reward will be forever that Through him, Adhan has been established in the whole world And You saw the dream too, but guess what? Allah can make anyone win And you, If you win in something Doesn't mean you have to win in everything you saw the dream, you got the reward forever, but you know what, frankly speaking, you don't have the loudest voice. And that doesn't fulfill the purpose of Adhan. So now in order to get this, I have to ask someone else to do it. There's no, there's no hard feelings. There's no reason for you to hard feel. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a gift that no one else had, He gave him a gift that you don't have, which is a louder voice. And we all complement one another. We work together to be able to achieve the greater good. So there's so many, mashallah, beautiful lessons in that uh, 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 story. But wh- why did we mention that over here? Rasulullah did not want anything that is going to bring resemblance to people of other faiths. He wanted Islam's way of leading life to be unique, to be special. Um, I was, uh, <clears throat> you know, I share one of, the, one of my uh, teachers, he was commenting, he said, in madrasas, sometimes in the graduation or in big halls, he says, sometimes you, you have <clears throat> VIPs coming in to your place. VIPs, politicians, famous celebrities, and so forth. And he would say that if the students sit on the ground and eat, then these people should also sit on the ground and eat. They should at least be offered a chance. If their knees hurt, they don't, can't sit comfortably. That's a different thing. But let's say in a Muslim country like Pakistan, where everyone grew up eating on the floor, mostly. And then eventually they became a, you know, a aristocrat or, or, or a wealthy person or businessman and, or a politician and where they had different ways of eating. But he said, when you invite such people to a madrasa, you should always not take it, you shouldn't always think that, oh, since he's a politician or he's a very wealthy man, that I must definitely need to serve him on the table and chair while the students eat on the floor. He said, at least you offer them to sit with them on the floor. And the point he said was beautiful. He said, these people who are coming from outside in that circle, they're always eating on the table and the chair. And they're always eating in their style of, of food. You are now trying to give them a new experience. And if you try to match whatever they have outside, 
they may not necessarily get the full experience that you had wanted them to get or what they wanted to get as well. By making sure that you try to give them an experience of what the students have, the sunnah aspect of sitting on the floor and eating, they will walk away more affected than you trying to take care of them by serving them on a table and chair while the rest are sitting on the floor. You all understand what I just said? Very deep. And I want to share with you, when I was in madrasa in South Africa, they would minister of defense of the entire country. The minister of defense. Big position. He came with his security guards and his entourage to the madrasa to visit. And I remember he was sitting, subhanAllah, with my principal, vice principal, in a very humble yani, uh, table and chair in, in a mess hall, in a corner. It was absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing yani, beautiful about it. It was a simple chair that the, even the workers would sit on. And a simple, you know, in, in the kitchen, when they get tired, they sit on it. Very simple, super simple. The food was whatever's in the mess hall. Was, was there And maybe the principal brought a few couple things at home Whatever his wife maybe had prepared for that day They weren't expecting the guest Just A couple things I happened to, my eyes fell upon that Then they came to the masjid for Dhuhr Salah And after Dhuhr Salah we were told That we're going to have a short program the Minister of Defense is here We're going to have a short program So I still remember this day so well One of the young students He gave an amazing talk Mulana Bilal on the what you know on the sacrifices and the early sacrifices of the people of Habasha or the people of Africa for Islam his whole talk was on that how, who Najashi was and who the people of Habasha were and how they came to assist Islam even before Rasulullah migrated to Medina what an amazing talk to give in front of a, 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 a African minister that this what this is the relationship between Islam and Africa Someone recited Quran, someone gave a talk, and what was so amazing was they pulled out a chair for him to sit on, and he refused to sit. He said, How can I sit on a chair while everyone else is sitting on the floor? And he was a you know a hefty big big guy, it wasn't very necessarily he's not used to sitting like this, how you and I are sitting on the floor. His knees aren't prepared for that. But it was an amazing sight to say, he said, I'm not gonna sit on the chair while the rest of the students are sitting on the floor. I like this. And then he gave a powerful talk And in the talk he mentioned One point What I want you to share with you He said this seminary, this school For me is like an oasis It's like a garden Where a person who is traveling through the desert When he needs to take rest He comes in to an oasis and gets rest Similarly, I feel After visiting this place That this is such a place of comfort and peace that I want to be able to always regard this place as a home away from home. He said this, I'm not going to wait for invitations from you. I don't want to have an invitation. I want to have an open door policy that whenever I get tired from life and political life, I can come and relax here for a couple hours. MashaAllah. What happened? He was able to enjoy and get the full experience. Now, again, you have to understand everything I say in a context. So there's a hadith called Anzilu Nasa Manazilhum. Which means honor people based on their status. So that has its own place. Don't you have a guest of honor who is used to eating in silver or goldware? Don't serve him in a uh, what you call a paper plate. That's disrespect for him. You get it? That's there in its own spot. Even in your own house, try to try to accommodate people to based on what they are. You find like Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward our students. They're always looking out for the teachers. I always say, okay, we know so Fulan teacher, he likes to have lukewarm water. Or Fulan teacher likes to have ice water. Or Fulan teacher's favorite ice cream is strawberry. Or Fulan is it's chocolate, whatever. They go out of the, the idea as well. You don't have to, no one asked them to do that. But the idea is, if I'm, if I'm gonna honor you with one meal, or I'm gonna honor you with, with one thing to drink, I wanna make sure, I'm gonna say, I'm, if I have the honor, rather I should say, of serving one meal, I wanna make sure it hits the spot. And we all like that. We all love to honor our guests. We wanna cook something that they like to eat. Not like, oh, this is what I want to eat, so you're going to have to eat with me. What is this? Whatever you like to eat, I'm cooking for you. So that has its own place. I want you to understand what well, this is something different. What is this? This is the idea of being able to get the full experience, the full spirituality. When someone follows the environment of the masjid and a madrasa, there is something beautiful in it. So now, 
sitting on the ground, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa eat on the ground? Most definitely. Did Rasulullah sit on the ground all the time? Most definitely. Did Rasulullah sleep on the floor? Most definitely. He had a very humble life. So if all we are doing while we're sitting in this dars here, and when our seminary students sit in the classroom on the floor, if they simply say, I have nothing to show you, Ya Allah, except that I want to emulate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi in the way he sat. Don't you think this is also sufficient for Allah to forgive you? Don't you think this is sufficient for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you great rewards? I repeat, sitting on the floor, the whole deen is not in there. People, they don't understand things. And they take it out of context. Acha, to zameen pe nebeer te to musulman nahi. If you don't sit on the floor, you're not a Muslim. Who said that? I'm saying this because I know some people say this. This is why I'm saying this. The people, you have to listen from beginning to end. And if you're out to criticize, then I can't help you. If your whole job is to criticize, and your whole job is to say that I'm going to keep the status quo, I'm not going to change my lifestyle, and everyone else must change, then I cannot help such people. They say, Ishkal karne wale ka jawab hoga. Sawal karne wale ka jawab hoga. Lekin muhtaris ka koi jawab nahi hai. Someone who asks a question, you can answer him. Someone who is confused about something, or, a criticize, or critiquing something, critiquing, you can answer him. But someone who is simply out there to criticize and find fault, you can never answer him. You can never answer him. You can never satiate him. You will always find something else to criticize about. So this is one of the things that we learn here is that not imitating others. We have a very beautiful way. So when you sit down and study and the, and the whole classroom etiquette, alhamdulillah, this is unique to our deen right now. Right? You won't see in any college environment any of this type of etiquette there. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Man minhum, he who ever in, in imitates a nation is of that nation." So, my beloved brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we should ensure that our method of eating and drinking, sleeping, dressing, and interacting with one another to whatever ability we have the kufi, we have the covering of our head, we have the jilbab and the hijab. All of these things are unique Islamic gear, and try our best to stay. Put to that There's so much barakah So much khair in this If those of you who heard my, the tafsir on Tuesday night Any of you were there this past Tuesday Do you remember one opinion I said Of one of the quick One of the reasons why the magicians Allah gave them hidayah even quicker MashaAllah Everyone's awake here yeah? All exam You all get A plus So have one extra cup of chai Inshallah on Tuesday all of you <laughs> Okay Allah rewards you all so they said the, 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 the magicians were wearing the robe similar to Musa alayhi salam. Ye mushabahat thi Musa alayhi salam kisat kaprome. They were wearing similar robes and said that mushabaha itself, may, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is mentioned in tafsir Ruh al Bayan. That this was became, they became the means of, or another means of Allah's hidayah coming towards them even quicker. To uhibbu salihina wa lastu minhum. Hazrat Abu Han, Imam Abu Hanifa's poem I love the pious I love the pious وَلَسْتُ minhum, And I'm not from amongst them Even though I'm not from amongst them I love the pious Even though I'm not from amongst them لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يَرْزُقُنِي صَلَحَ I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Will grant me piety one day and This is what they said So the same thing for all of us is that Let's fake it till we make it We dress like the pious Act like the pious Say salam like the pious Have the akhlaq like the pious Have the emotions like the pious And one day Allah will make us pious Don't think that this is hypocrisy So these are these virtues that we talked about For uh, 10th of Muharram And along with that They are in some riwayat What is that? The person who spends on his family On the 10th of Muharram Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put barakah in his sustenance. There are different, differing opinions about the authenticity of this hadith. But what is very unique and amazing is that the narrators of this hadith all say that we have, exper we have experience of this hadith for the past five decades, four decades, and we found it to be absolutely true. That whoever spends on his family on the 10th of Muharram, Allah puts barakah in his sustenance for the whole year. So we should take this uh, virtue as well Tomorrow to spend some money on our family Our wives and our children Our spouses and children Have a meal Order a meal Cook a meal Do something Buy them a gift 
and we will see inshallah wa ta'ala with this niyyah that ya Allah through the barakah of this day allow me to have bar- uh, muhabba and love the most important thing I think right now we all need is love within the families which is falling apart understanding within the families which is falling apart so ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that ya Allah I want barakah in, my, in, my, in, in, in this family not only in sustenance but that in all the members of the family get along with one another so this is because specific to Ashura and I, inshallah we'll fast tomorrow and we'll have iftar tomorrow here light iftar we've come 20 minutes before maghrib so we can do some dhikr and dua and, uh, 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 and and then if you haven't fasted today fast try to fast tomorrow now there is specific reward mentioned there are specific points that about Musa a.s. being saved on this day and Rasulullah's hijrah taking place where he got saved from the cave I will speak about this tomorrow before Maghrib so let's try to be here uh, at least 20-25 minutes before Maghrib if we can come here by 7.40 uh, or 7.30, 7.30 rather it would be great inshallah and we can mention those points let us use the remaining time to do some dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we can make some dua as well inshallah So, uh, I, uh, since, uh, the, uh, dhikr is done through the heart, dhikr is done through the tongue and the heart. There are so many different ways doing dhikr. You can do it quietly, softly, you can do it out loud, you can do it collectively, you can do it individually. There is a beautiful book, Sabahatul Fikr, uh, downstairs in the bookstore that's been translated into English, a book on the virtues and the permissibility of doing dhikr collectively and out loud as well. So, I request all the brothers who have, uh, sisters who have doubt about that. Instead of to feel to think that some bid'ah is being done To actually uh, purchase the book from downstairs And there's beautiful articles also in Arabic I can share with anyone <laughs> Ask if you don't know Don't sit and accuse people of doing bid'ah without knowledge So this is something I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always save this institution And all of us here from indulging in anything that is not proven from the sunnah Amin Rabbil Alameen لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا إله إلا الله 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 محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا إله إلا الله 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 محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد 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 صلى الله عليه وسلم 
صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم استغفر الله 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 الذي لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم واتوب اليه now we'll take a moment to do a quick meditation of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we sit here in the house of Allah or wherever we're listening to let us take a moment concentrate close our eyes as we are faced towards the qibla focus on the mercy of Allah that is descending upon you and I if it wasn't the mercy of Allah we would definitely not be listening to this right now and we would not be blessed what we are blessed with now so let us focus we simple, the mercy of Allah is always coming at us but we need to concentrate we need to focus. We need to, as they say, you need to listen to the sounds of nature. Well, similarly, you need to focus on the nur and the mercy of Allah and the faith of Allah, as they say, descending upon our hearts. Let's take a moment and focus that Allah is looking upon us with the eyes of mercy and His mercy is, faith is defending, descending upon our heads and moving onto our hearts and the rest of our body and upon this entire gathering. Take a moment and focus on your heart Saying Allah, Allah, Allah The dhikr of the heart only Without moving your lips, without moving your tongue Let's take a moment to do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم انت السلام انت السلام وتبارك في هذا الجلال والاكرام اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله اللهم لا نحصي ثناء عليك انت كما اثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم سبحان الله وبحمده عند اذى خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنه عرشه ومداد كلماته اللهم لك الحمد حمدا دائما مع دوامك ولك الحمد حمدا خالدا مع خلودك ولك الحمد حمدا حتى ترضى ولك الحمد حمدا اذا رضيت لا اله الا هو الحليم الكريم سبحان الله رب العرش العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم انا نسالك بموجبات رحمتك وعن زائم مغفرتك والغنيمه من كل بر والسلامة من كل إثم اللهم لا تدع لنا في مقام هذا ذما إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا ضالا إلا هديته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة هي لك رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا عنتنا وسرت لنا يا رحم الرحمين اللهم يا حي يا قيوم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أصلح لنا شأننا كله لا تكن إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين اللهم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين ربنا أفرق علينا الصبر وتوفنا مسلمين ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت قدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للقوم الظالمين ونجينا برحمتك من القوم الكافرين اللهم يا حي يا قيوم يا حنان يا منان يا بديع السماوات والأرض يا ذا الجلال والإكرام إنا نسألك التقوى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا وأصلح ذات بيننا وانصرنا على من عادانا وعاد الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين واحفظ الإسلام والمسلمين وانصر الإسلام والمسلمين وانصر المستضعفين من المسلمين في كل مكان رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرة رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرة رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرة لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا الله يا الله we ask you to accept our gathering of majlis, this majlis of dhikr of dua of remembrance O oh Allah accept the fast of those who are fasting O oh Allah accept the intentions of those who are intending to fast uh, tomorrow and the day after O oh Allah we ask you to make these fast a means of our salvation a means of our forgiveness O oh Allah make tomorrow's fast a means of forgiving all of our sins of not only of this past year but our past life Ya Allah O oh Allah allow us all to make sincere tawbah from all major and minor sins, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, allow us to leave our habit, break our bad habits. Ya Allah, we ask you to grant us strong iman. Grant us our children strong iman. Keep our youth and our young generations on, the str- on iman. O oh Allah, please, Ya Allah, we are living in a challenging era. And indeed, you have, willing, you have with your own knowledge put us into this era. O oh Allah, we beg you, Ya Allah, that you continue to grant us your mercy by which we will be able to remain firm in this difficult era. O oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to grant us firmness in our faith. Firmness in our iman, firmness in our dedication to the Quran. Oh Allah, anyone who's facing any obstacle in reading Quran, any obstacle in memorizing Quran, any any obstacle in doing dhikr, any obstacle in coming to the masjid, any obstacle in following any commands of the deen. Oh Allah, any mom and dad who are having difficulty with in, in getting their children to follow the deen, any children who are having a difficulty to get their parents to follow the deen, any brother or sister who is having difficulty to get his siblings to follow the deen, Ya Allah, open each of each their hearts, Ya Allah, towards Islam. Allow all these people to understand the beauty of this deen and make it easy for us and all of them to, Ya Allah, follow every single injunction of the deen that is related to us, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, make sunnah our second nature. Make sunnah our second nature. Make sunnah our second nature. O oh Allah, give us the tools to raise our children properly in this day and age. Allow us to have the know-how how to raise our children properly in this day and age. O oh Allah, please save our homes from the evil effects and attacks of shaitan. O oh Allah, save this madrasa, this masjid, and all its facets, its departments, O oh Allah, from evil attacks of shaitan. O oh Allah, save every musalli and every volunteer and every uh, supporter, every well-wisher and every ustad, every staff member, every student, past, present, and future, Ya Allah, of protect them and their families from the evil insinuations and attacks of shaitan. O oh Allah, allow us to see the devil's deceptions. Allow us to be able to easily see how shaitan is trying to attack us and then give us the means to be able to protect ourselves. So, O oh Allah, those who are suffering anywhere, anywhere in the world, Ya Allah, O oh Allah, grant them all this patience in this difficult time. O oh Allah, grant them sabr jameel. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, make their difficulty that they're going through a means of their forgiveness and a means of them becoming worthy of the highest levels of Jannah al-Firdaus. Subhana rabbika rabbil aizzati amma sifoon wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Can, those brothers who are fasting, inshallah, if you can proceed downstairs uh, for, for, for to break your fast. Those brothers fasting, proceed, proceed downstairs to break your fast. Uh, we will have jama'ah in, in five minutes, inshallah. We'll be delaying jama'ah a little bit. So the rest of us can, after the adhan, can do some dhikr and dua, inshallah, till the jama'ah begins. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر 
Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu an la 